So when discussing now the fossil record in modern biology, let's now again consider the predictions. Evolution, again, as a rule, refuses to invoke any sort of divine intervention when doing science. It says that all biology is related back to one or three common ancestors. And that this obviously takes millions of years of time. It's a slow, gradual process. And that this millions of years of evolution resulted in many transitional forms, which should show up in the fossil record. The creation model, in contrast, or did the Genesis text, says that God created 6,000 years ago distinct kinds of classes. Again, we don't know scientifically what this means, but we do know that kinds don't give rise to other kinds. There's no mixing here. There's gaps, there's distinctions, there's discontinuity, as I said. And that this happened in the recent past, not over millions of years. And since, again, the consequence of this not intermixing of kinds means that there should, be any, there should not be any transitional forms between kinds. I'm going to give you one slide on the fossil record. There are, to date, few of any transitional forms. They're going to have colleagues who have written more about this. Just by way of aside, Steve J. Gould, a noted evolutionist, invented his own theory of evolution function with equi equilibrium to try to address these major gaps in the fossil record. And so even from evolutionists themselves, there's acknowledgment that there are much fewer transitional forms than Darwin anticipated. And the usual answer they get is that more time is needed. We've been looking for about 150 years, and we still haven't found a whole lot. So I'll let you evaluate whether more time will reveal the answer. So now I want to move over into modern biology, in particular some stuff that I've done. And before I talk about some of my own data, I want to make you aware of this concept of irreducible complexity, which Michael Bakey has promulgated. And before I do, let me give you just a quick overview of the, the mechanism of evolution. So if you summarize evolution in the process in one sentence, it's basically survival of the fittest to reproduce. Not just survival of the fittest, because if you want to evolve your organism, you have to pass on your genes to your offspring. And this is supposed to occur gradually, step by step, over time, from primitive to the complex. And scientifically, this is natural selection, that kind of variation, which in less technical terms just simply means that you have a population of one type of organism, and a couple of them get a mutation. Evolution will occur when natural selection eliminates those that don't have the mutation, those that do survive, pass on the genes to their offspring, and then evolution moves forward. Now, what's critical, and even Darwin acknowledged this, that if you could find step-by-step -step molecular details that just couldn't be explained about evolution, his whole theory would fall apart. And Behe has interrogated this challenge, so to speak. Uh, he's a biochemist. And has coined this term irreducible complexity, which I'm going to explain now by an example. Now, this is probably the most technical part of the talk, and I'll try to give you both the technical and the, the simple version of it. So I did my PhD on the role of vitamin D in blood stem cells, so vitamin D is near and dear to my heart. The major role of vitamin D is in the regulation, basically the physiology of calcium regulation as it is released in the blood. There's a gland in your neck, the parathyroid gland, which expresses a protein, the calcium sensing receptor, which senses levels of calcium in the blood. So in less technical terms, you just have the gland in your neck that knows when calcium goes up and down. And it's not just a sensor, it also does things in response when the levels change. So let's say the levels go down, it will release another protein, parathyroid hormone, or PTH. So again, in simple, simpler terms, you have calcium in your blood, your neck senses how high and how low it is, and when something's amiss, it sends out a red alert signal. Before I tell you what this red alert signal does, we have to bring in vitamin D. So vitamin D is, you know, you can get in your milk, you can synthesize it in your skin, but both of these forms are biologically inactive. They must be chemically modified, vitamin D has to be chemically modified twice, once in the liver, once in the kidney, by a little molecular machine, a protein, an enzyme, it modifies it once, the kidney modifies it again, and adds a hydroxyl group. And so now in less technical terms, let me just run through this again. So you have calcium in your blood, regulated by your neck. If it senses something wrong, it sends out a red alert signal. This now acts on the kidney and says, get vitamin D more chemically activated. There's more to this loop. So vitamin D, when it's chemically activated, doesn't by itself change calcium. It has to go to the gut and act on its receptor, the vitamin D receptor, the VDR, and, tell the, and by this means, tell the gut to take up calcium from your diet. And this is now finally the last step, this calcium then can eventually restore the drop in blood calcium. So let me just run through this one more time. Again, you have calcium in your blood, gland in your neck senses when it changes, it sends out red alert signals to modify and activate vitamin D. Vitamin D tells your gut to take up more calcium. This is actually an oversimplification. There are many molecular details I've left out, but I think it's sufficient to make a point about irreducible complexity. 
So let me just highlight the key parts of the system. You have the sensor in your neck, you have the signal that relays out the uh, parathyroid hormone. The kidney receives the signal. It doesn't do anything by itself. It, the, the cells in the kidney modify vitamin D. Vitamin D is on the messenger that goes to the gut. And then you have a, another signal or another uh, protein in your gut that knows when something has occurred. So here we have, at a minimum, six interacting components. And if you were to remove any one of these, the whole system would collapse. So in my PhD, I had a mouse that didn't have this vitamin D receptor, and they die at about 10 weeks of age because they can't regulate the serum calcium. And the same would hold true for any one of these other systems, or any one of these other components. If you remove the parathyroid hormone, you'd have a gland in your neck that can sense when something's wrong, but has no way to tell the body what to do. And so Beige has coined the term irreducible complexity to point out systems such as these. Systems in which if you remove any one of the components, everything just collapses. And this is significant for evolution, again, because Darwin himself said you need to be able to explain step by step, and if you can't, his theory of evolution collapses. And so essentially, you'd have to have six simultaneous mutations all at once, or you'd have no regulation of strain calcium. So it's useful now to point out what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, I'm not asking, can we arrange calcium regulation from primitive organisms up to complex? That's really not the question. That's really a question of classification. This is, this is actually Darwin's question. Can we step by step modify something that's existing into this complex, irreducibly complex structure? And what makes this problem worse is that I've just shown you my own personal example, and there are many more of these irreducibly complex systems in the body, which again presents many hurdles for evolution. But to me, if you have to invoke multiple simultaneous mutations all at once, the chance of this happening is extremely low, and it sounds almost miraculous to me. And the last I checked, you can't invoke miracles of evolution, so it raises the question then of whether evolution can, as you know, again, Darwin raised this question, whether this is a viable theory. But that wasn't the question. You ask you a really, a really specific thing. Not, I mean, I'm well, that's right. I forgot to address the uh, prediction. Sorry, I'll get to you in a second. Pr predictions of the. So I would say, because of the nature of the historical question, and we can discuss this more offline, but I have yet to hear someone come up with a prediction I can test, and whenever I present data, they always come up with an explanation. So at the end of the day, because it's a historical question, neither are really falsifiable. Neither evolution nor creation. So you can summarize it quickly by saying any objection usually raised to creation in terms of the nature of science and so forth boils down to, I think, usually a misunderstanding of the nature of historical science. You can't falsify creation, that's for sure, but you also can't falsify evolution. Usually the examples people cite are microevolution and so forth.